Good morning. It is good to be back with you. Thank you for uh, for bearing with Blake while I was gone. I know that was torture, but yeah, he gave me one of these. Great job, Blake. Thank you so much for, for covering for him, for Travis uh, while I was gone. Uh, I had a great time in Missouri, but it is good to be back, be back home. So I appreciate you, uh, you know, thinking about me, praying for me while I was away. I want to start this morning by giving you a few inspirational quotes that I have no doubt will be helpful to you as you strive to overcome worry and anxiety. So here they are. Worry pulls tomorrow's cloud over today's sunshine. Pretty good, right? Here's another one. Worry often gives a small thing a big shadow. Think about that. Here's one. Every night before you go to sleep, turn your worries over to God. He'll be up all night anyway. Worry is interest paid by those who borrow trouble. And then finally this one. Pray. Let God worry. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear quotes like that or I see these quotes on Pinterest with a beautiful sunset, suddenly all of the burden of worry is lifted from my shoulders. I no longer have any anxiety at all. You know, I, I, I love Disney movies and, you know, Akuna Matata, when, they, when I hear that song being sung, I, I just have all my worries vanish away. When I hear the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, I think, yeah, that's it. Don't worry, just be happy. I see a church sign that says, we are much too blessed to be, to be depressed. And I think, yeah, that's it. Why am I worried? Why am I depressed? Hopefully you've caught on to my sarcasm. Because let's face it, trite little sayings, even though they're quotable and may be interesting, they don't do any good. They don't. They do nothing. And singing warthogs don't do any good. A Disney song sung by make-believe characters doesn't do any good. In all of our efforts to try and help people deal with worry, we come up short, don't we? Saying to someone, you're much too blessed to be depressed, doesn't help, and it doesn't get to the root of the problem. Because you know as well as I do that the problem of worry is much deeper than that, and it doesn't get fixed with Disney songs or with trite little sayings. For instance, try telling someone who has just been diagnosed with stage four cancer, that they are too blessed to be depressed. Try telling someone who has a child that was raised in a Christian upbringing and who has turned away from that upbringing and immersed themselves in a culture of drugs. Try telling them, hey, don't worry because that's sin. Try telling someone who recently lost their spouse of 50 years that they shouldn't worry. You know, I deal with death on a regular basis. And most of the time, I deal with death from the standpoint of someone who has lived a long life in service to the king, and it's easy to say things about them at their funeral because they have been faithful unto death. But it's a whole different game when it's a suicide. It's a whole different game when someone takes their life and you have to go and console that family and talk to them as they search for answers and wonder, why did this happen? How could we have not seen the warning signs? There's all kinds of collateral damage that comes with suicide. It's a whole different deal when it's a, it's a young child, like recently, you know, in the Wiley School District, we lost a young man who was five years old, a four-wheeler accident, he passed away. Being a member of the school board, one of the things that I do is go with the superintendent and the principal and, and go and console that family moments after it happens. I don't know how to deal with that. I'm sure I don't do a very good job. But I'll tell you what doesn't work. Standing around singing Hakuna Matata, telling them don't worry, just be happy. Even holding hands and singing, it as well usually doesn't get to the heart of the issue or doesn't make them feel all that great going forward. And I don't know if a sermon on worry is what you need, but I want to give it a shot this morning. I believe that all too often we make light of worry. 
We look at it as some sort of emotional flaw that you just need to get over. And so what happens all too often is we treat worry and anxiety as if it's not a big deal and that if you just had more faith in God, you wouldn't be worried all the time. And I don't think that's true. Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's fine and good. Paul says, do not worry. That's a direct command, and so if I violate that direct command, I am sinning, right? But wait a minute. Didn't the same Paul who said, do not worry, worry? He did. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23 and following, we see him give a rather extensive list of the trials and tribulations and abuses that he had to face. And he ends it all by saying, and above all this, there is the pressure on me of concern or worry for all the churches. Paul was worried about the church. He was worried about his work in dedication to the church, into spreading the gospel. And let me tell you, folks, I would hope that you are worried about some things in your life, especially those things that are of spiritual concern. If you're an elder in the Lord's church, I would hope that you have concern about the, shepherd, uh, about the sheep that you are shepherding. This past week, I was in Neosho, Missouri, and I stayed with one of their elders, a good friend of mine, John and, and John and I were talking one night, and, and he was talking about how he doesn't sleep much. They've got some issues in the church that he's, he's concerned about, and he doesn't sleep much. I want my elders to be concerned about the flock. I want my deacons to be concerned about the job that they have been assigned. I want parents that are Christians to be concerned about the spiritual leadership that they are providing their children. Some things warrant our concern and our anxiety, right? Of course, the problem becomes when worry overrides faith. When we become over-concerned about things to the point that it pushes our faith out of the picture. What about Jesus? Did Jesus worry? Do you remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane with the cross looming in the foreground? It says that he sweated drops of blood. He says, I am grieved, my soul is grieved, to the point of death. That sounds like worry to me, doesn't it, you? When Jesus stated, do not worry, did he mean that we were to never feel the emotion? When Paul said, be anxious for nothing, did he mean that the same God who endowed us with emotion is telling us, go against your human nature? I know I endowed you with, this, with these emotions, but you can never feel them or else you're sinning. Is that what he meant? Obviously not. You know as well as I do that there are things that come with living in this fallen world that are anything but benign or minor, and our response of worry or anxiety is natural, even warranted sometimes. We tend to deal with worry by simply examining the emotion. And so, like I've said before, we talk to somebody who's worrying, and you say, well, don't worry. Well, I am. Well, stop. Well, I can't stop. Well, you need to stop because you're sinning. The Bible says do not worry. And now that person is even more worried because now they're going to hell because they're worrying, right? It's this vicious cycle. The problem is we deal with worry on an emotional level, and it's much deeper than that. Worry is not just about emotion. It's about what's tied to that emotion. Let me ask you, what are you most worried about? See if you agree with this. According to the psychological health care website, the primary things that most people worry about are money, the future, job security, relationships, and health. Those are the things on your list, probably. Because what I notice when I read through that list is health and finances are universal concerns. Virtually everybody in the world worries about their health and their finances. And you know what? Virtually everybody in the world, as long as they're alive, are going to worry about their health and finances, right? That's not something that goes away. You're, you're going to worry about it until the day that you die. Here's something else I found interesting. One survey found that the average person spends 14.3 hours worrying each week. That comes up to 744 hours of worrying each year, which turns into 45,243 hours of worrying over a lifetime. That equals 1,885 days in a lifetime spent doing nothing but worrying, 
which means that the average person spends 5.2 years of their life handcuffed by worry. No wonder we don't sleep, right? Look with me at Matthew chapter 6. Beginning in verse 19, it says this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Growing up, I played a lot of sports, and I would have a lot of different experiences with coaches. I had several coaches that yelled at me but never told me what I was doing wrong. Maybe you had the same experience. I'd come off to the sideline, they would yell and scream at me, but never tell me what I did wrong. I was too afraid to ask them what I did wrong. So guess what happened? I went out there and messed up again and got yelled at again. There is a big difference between yelling and coaching. A good coach, a coach that is worth his salt, will teach. He will understand that his role is a teacher. And so if he wants the best out of his athletes, then he is going to train them well, he is going to teach them, he is going to point out, especially in practice, what you did wrong, so that when you get in the game, you'll get it right. Jesus is not yelling at us here. And I think that's what we think sometimes when we look at, at, at subjects like worry, that Paul or Jesus is yelling at us. No, Jesus is coaching us. And what he is saying here in Matthew 6, 19 through 24, is not that, that we shouldn't just worry. He's telling us why we shouldn't worry. It's not just about, well, quit worrying. It's sin. No, Jesus is not being condescending here. He's not yelling at us. He's telling us the why, the reason behind why we shouldn't worry. And you're looking at me saying, well, where does he even mention worry in Matthew 6, 19 through, 19 through 24? Well, he doesn't. But starting in verse 25, he does. To understand what he is saying in verses 25 and following, you have, to, you have to look at what he is setting up in Matthew 6, 19 through 24. And in the Middle East, a person's wealth often consisted of, among other things, a change of clothes. People in this day and time didn't have a lot of different clothes. They didn't have a variety in their wardrobe. And so if you're wealthy, it often meant that you had a change of clothes, several different clothes. And Jesus says, don't put your emphasis on that. You may be wealthy, you may have a lot of different clothes to wear, but malls are going to get in and destroy them. And even if they don't, you eventually get sick of what you wear anyway. You ever go to your closet and go, I just don't have anything to wear. And you have tons of stuff to wear. There is no permanency in our clothing. And Jesus says, so don't put your faith and trust in that. And he also says, don't put unnecessary emphasis on things that rust can destroy. Now, it's interesting, the Greek word for rust here is brosis, and it literally means eating away. Nowhere else in Scripture do we find it translated rust, which is interesting. The likely picture is that Jesus is talking about worms and rats and mice that get into grain that people stored into barns, and they eat away at it and pollute it. And so, the job of anyone who had a lot of wealth and stored a lot of grain in barns was to try to make certain that the vermin didn't get into it, which was almost impossible. And so Jesus is saying it's an effort in futility. Don't put all of your, your trust and faith in things that, that worms and mice and, and rats are going to eat away at. You know, there are certain pleasures in life that over time they erode. It may become physically less able to enjoy them, or we mature to a point that there's no longer satisfaction in them. Either way, we should be cautious about giving our lives and our heart to something that the years can take away. And then Jesus talks about how we shouldn't put unnecessary emphasis on things that we keep hold up in our house that thieves can just break in and take anyway. Back in this day and time, houses were basically made of baked clay. And so it didn't take much effort for somebody to just dig through the clay and get into someone's house and steal all of their possessions. Jesus says, it's really futile 
to put your faith and trust in those things because they can vanish in a heartbeat. Kind of like us putting our faith and trust in the stock market, right? All the, you know, it can plummet in one day. We can lose everything, right? You know, money is a, a huge source of worry for us. And not only money, but the stuff that we can buy with our money, right? And so when it comes to the treasures that we buy with our money, when it comes to money itself, I think it all relates to a spiritual arrhythmia. When we talk about worry, we go beyond the emotion and we talk about the heart. We have an irregular heartbeat many times. And arrhythmia simply means that your heart is beating out of rhythm. It's not beating properly. And so when you go to the doctor, he addresses the issue by looking at the problem area. What is causing your heart not to beat properly? And many times they'll install a pacemaker or they'll go in and ablate or destroy the area that's causing the problem if they're able to do that. And it's the same with us. We have a spiritual arrhythmia that is causing us to put our faith and trust or to have our heart beat for things that really don't matter in eternity. And we've got to address those issues. We've got to destroy them if need be. And Jesus is the great pacemaker that gets our heart beating properly. Worry, you see, is directly tied to devotion. We worry about the things that we're most devoted to. That makes sense, right? We worry about the treasures that we have stored up here in, on earth, whether it be money or the things that we can buy with our money. And so we worry about those things, right? You see, I don't worry about your job. I don't. That doesn't concern me. Now, if you lost your job, I would be sad with you. And if you came and talked to me about that, we would pray about it. And I, I mean, I would definitely share that burden with you. But your job doesn't keep me up at night. The stresses associated with your job don't keep me awake at night. Your kids don't keep me awake at night. Yes, I'm concerned about your children, especially spiritually. And if you shared a concern with me about your children, then certainly I'm there willing to listen and willing to help in any way that I can. But whether your child makes an A or an F on a chemistry test doesn't concern me. I don't stay awake at night worrying about that. I don't worry if your child is starting on the football or basketball team. It's not a concern for me. They're not a concern to me because I'm not devoted to those things. I don't worry about your retirement. If you came and expressed your, your concern with me about losing your job and maybe not having retirement when it comes down to it, yes, I would listen to you and I would, I would cry with you and I would try to help you as much as I can, but that doesn't keep me awake at night. Because I'm not devoted to those things. Your job, your children, your finances, those are not things that keep me awake at night because I'm not devoted to them. I have enough worries of my own, right? With my job, with my children, with, with my finances. We worry about the things that we're devoted to. And what you're devoted to may be different than what I'm devoted to, but at the end of the day, those are the things that we're concerned about. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, which means that worry is a heart problem. It's not an emotional problem, and we've got to stop treating it like it is. This also means that you don't solve the problem of worry or anxiety by trying harder or having more willpower. You know, people say, well, you wouldn't worry so much if you just had more faith. Maybe, but it's not so much about that. We've got to get deeper. We've got to look at the heart of it. I mean, that's kind of like saying you cure insomnia by trying to go to sleep. We've got to go deeper. We've got to look at this from a, a different angle. If you want your heart to beat properly again, then you have to deal with the arrhythmia. You have to deal with what's causing it to be out of rhythm, and you have to deal with it effectively. If you want to deal with worry effectively, you've got to deal with what worry is tethered to. What is it connected to? Let's continue in Matthew chapter 6. He says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? 
And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The first thing I want you to notice here is that Jesus doesn't dismiss the reason for our worries. His tone is not one of condescension. I don't read anger in Jesus' words. I think as a human being, Jesus dealt with worry. We already pointed that out. However, take note of verse 25 again. He says, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. For this reason. What reason is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the reason why you can't serve two masters. There's a reason why you can't serve both God and mammon. And mammon here, by the way, is talking about more than money. It's just talking about possessions or stuff in general. Treasures, riches, all those things. Jesus says when God is in control, when you serve him, you don't deal, or I should say it this way, you don't have to worry about the things that moth and rust can destroy or thieves can break in and steal because you're going to be provided for. Make sense? But here's the thing. We have to admit that the things that Jesus addresses here for us in this room typically are not the problem, right? We're not all that concerned about what we're going to wear. We have plenty of clothes. We're not worried about having to get up and go naked for the day because we have nothing to wear. And for most of us, virtually all of us, we're not too worried about money as far as having enough just to survive. Some are, but, but most of us know. We're worried about having enough money to retire on. We're worried about having enough money maybe to, uh, to have the things that we want. So the concerns that Jesus is addressing here maybe are not so much the, the concerns that we have. Our worry is about more uh, paying off debt and our financial future and, and what we're going to wear, not if we're going to have enough to wear. Our worry is about our kids and what they will become. Our anxiety is about whether we'll get past the next round of layoffs. Our worry is about things that are different, but there's still a principle that applies, and it's found in the second part of verse 25, where Jesus says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, is not life more than making money? Is not life more than planning for your retirement? Is not life more than your kids' grades or their success in sports? Is not life more than stuff? Is not life more than your health even? Because the issue of worry is about something bigger. It's about life's ambition. It's about asking and answering the question, what are you living for? What are you pursuing? What are you chasing after? What are you devoted to? Jesus says, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what we will wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all things. The Gentiles, those who didn't even believe in God, they worried about those things. You're going to be provided for. Observe the lilies of the field. They don't do anything, and God clothes them. Observe the birds of the air. God provides for them. They weren't even created in his image, and he provides for them. How much more is he going to take care of you? Not only that, he sent his son to die a cruel death on a cruel cross for you. You don't think he's going to take care of you when it comes to the basics of life? Then he says in verse 33, he says, after saying, is not life more than this, he says what the more is. The more is this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What would it look like for us to consider the birds of the air and the lilies of the field? Have you ever thought about that? What would that look like for us? Maybe turning off our cell phone? Maybe walking away from the television or the computer. Maybe getting out and looking at nature and gazing on the beauty of God's creation and seeing the majesty of what he has created. Considering that none of that was made in his image, but you are. 
And therefore, all the things you worry about, you're going to be taken care of in the things that matter most because that's a promise from our Lord. Worry is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to re-examine our priorities. It's an opportunity to see what receives the lion's share of your attention. Remember, the emotion follows the devotion. So when you're worried about the, uh, the things that you're worried about the most are going to be the things that you're most devoted to. Whatever it is that you're devoted to will directly affect your anxiety level. To put it another way, your over-concerns reveal your over-loves. Over-worrying results in over-loving something. And once you reveal what your over-loves are, then you can address how to understate them or how to lessen your concern. Jesus never said that this world was unimportant. What he did emphasize over and over again was that this world's importance is not in itself. Rather, the importance of this world is what it leads to. This world is not the end-all, be-all. This world is a stage along the way. And throughout Scripture, we see that money and stuff was meant to be a tool, not a master. You can only serve one master. The book of Acts, the early Christians pooled their money together to help anyone who might have need. In Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, it reads, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new, new wine. Paul stated, In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. I want you to do something tonight or this week for homework. I want you to make a list they got a pen and a paper and just make a list. Write down all the things that trouble you. It may be a rather lengthy list, but what are the things that give you the most concern in life? What are the things you worry about the most? What are the things you stress about the most? And just be open and honest as you write all of them down. And then examine them. And see if this doesn't hold true, because my guess is, out of all the things you write down, of all the things you put on that list, there will be things that will take care of themselves. There will be things that involve God's timing. There will be things that no matter how much you worry about, you will never be able to change them or fix them anyway. See if that doesn't hold true. And at the bottom of that list, I want you to write out 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. I'm going to tell you what it is. You'll have to look it up. Write it out. Write those two verses out. Don't just write 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Write them out. And let them serve as a reminder that God is bigger than the things that you worry about. That God is going to take care of you. He didn't promise to meet your every whim, your every want, and your every need, but he is going to take care of you in the things that matter most. And we can trust him on that because if God says something, we can take it to the bank, right? And let me leave you with a question this morning. This is a very simple question, but how you answer it means everything in your daily walk with God, including how you handle worry. Here it is. Can God be trusted? In your heart of hearts, do you believe that you can trust God no matter what comes? No matter how much you gain, how much you lose, no matter if your daily walk takes you through the valley of the shadow of death, are you all in? And do you believe that through it all, God can be trusted. How you answer that question is going to reveal a lot about your heart. In fact, it will reveal everything. Maybe you have a spiritual arrhythmia. Maybe your heart is out of whack. Maybe you need to get it back into rhythm this morning. We're here to help you, to encourage you, to pray with, uh, pray with you if we need to. 
whatever it takes to get it back into rhythm. Maybe we need to, myself or one of the elders or one of the other staff members, maybe we need to address the problem area. We're willing to do that. And maybe your problem is bigger than even a few problem areas. Maybe you're just one walking problem in that you've not, that you've not put on Christ in baptism and started a daily walk with God. And so your heart is beating for the things of this world and it's not beating for Christ. Maybe you're ready to get it back in a spiritual rhythm this morning. Whatever it is, we want to help you. If we can only look at life through the filter of death and understand that we have a limited time here on this earth, therefore our heart needs to be beating for the right things so that if Jesus comes back or we leave, whichever comes first, we're ready, we're prepared. So if you have a need this morning that we can help you with, Luke's going to lead us in a song. Why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing?